Hey everyone, welcome back to Science in 10. As we covered in the previous video, materials in the early Earth during its initial formation separated themselves out according to density in a process of density stratification, also known as planetary differentiation. Here, let's expand on that process and discuss the Earth's interior and how that leads to the biggest concept in all of modern geology, plate tectonics. So as a quick recap of density stratification, when we have a mixture of materials in a container, such as a, a clear glass tube, a bottle of salad dressing, or the early Earth's interior, for example, if we give it enough time, what will happen is the denser material will sink towards the bottom, or in the Earth's case, towards the center of the early Earth, and the lighter materials will float towards the Earth's surface. So with respect to our early Earth, this process of density stratification gave rise to a discrete structure or layering of the Earth's interior. So we can describe the Earth's interior in two separate ways. The first is we can categorize different layers of Earth's interior by their chemical composition. These are the initial layers that formed due to that density stratification process, again, during early Earth's history. Starting at the very center of the Earth, we have the Earth's core. The Earth's core is composed primarily of iron and nickel alloys. Surrounding the core, we have the mantle. The mantle is the bulk of Earth's interior, and it's composed of fairly high-density iron and magnesium-rich minerals. Surrounding the mantle, we have the thin crust of the Earth. This is the lightest material that floated all the way towards the surface during that early density stratification. Many minerals that compose rocks in the Earth crust are high in aluminum, calcium, silicon, and oxygen. Another way to classify layers of the Earth's interior is by their physical properties, or how do the layers behave or move. Starting at the very center, we have the inner core. The inner core is a solid ball of iron and nickel. Surrounding the inner core, we have the outer core. The outer core has the exact same composition as the inner core, but it is liquid. The outer core of the Earth is completely liquid. Surrounding the outer core, and again composing the bulk of Earth's interior, is the mesosphere, otherwise known as the middle sphere. The mesosphere is incredibly hot, but it's also somewhat mobile. It's ductile. It's a solid, but it flows very slowly, and it flows over geologic time. Surrounding the mesosphere, we have the asthenosphere, the weak sphere. The asthenosphere is a thin layer towards the top of the upper mantle, which is fairly mushy, if you want to think about that in terms of its consistency. It's not fully solid, but it's not fully liquid. And because it is mushy, it's also highly mobile. And then on top of the asthenosphere, we have the lithosphere, the sphere of rock, the outermost anywhere from 50 to 100 kilometers of the Earth. The lithosphere is solid, and when it tries to deform, it breaks. So let's concentrate on these top two physical or mechanical layers of the planet, the rigid lithosphere and the mushy asthenosphere underneath. So keep these two layers and their properties in mind as we move throughout the rest of this video. So coming back to plate tectonics, the central tenet behind this whole idea is that the lithosphere is broken into numerous rigid pieces known as plates. These plates, quote unquote, float on top of the denser asthenosphere. And since the asthenosphere is mushy, these rigid lithospheric plates can slide around on top of the asthenosphere over geologic time. And depending how detailed we want to be, there are anywhere between just over a dozen and over 30 separate tectonic plates or microplates that the lithosphere is broken into. At the boundaries between separate plates, the plates on either side are moving relative to each other. Plates can move away from each other, creating space for molten material from the upper mantle to rise up and form new crust. Or plates can move towards each other in a process of collision, building cool. volcanic and continental mountain ranges. And thirdly, plates can slide laterally or horizontally past each other. But what drives this motion? There needs to be some sort of mechanism that causes gigantic pieces of the Earth's lithosphere to move. It turns out that one of the drivers of plate tectonics is the exact same process you use to boil water on top of a stove. Convection. In our pot of water, heat from the stove warms water at the bottom of the pot. This warm water decreases in density so it rises to the top of the pot where it begins to cool. Cooler water from the surface is slightly denser and sinks back towards the bottom of the pot 
where it heats up again, repeating this process. Within the Earth's interior, convection currents drive warm material from depth up through the asthenosphere where the material then cools and sinks back down to lower depths within the Earth. As the material is cooling, it is also moving parallel to the Earth's surface, providing a slight amount of traction to the base of the lithosphere. But convection alone is not nearly powerful enough to drive plate motion by itself. Other processes taking place at plate boundaries add substantially to the forces driving plate motion. At boundaries where plates move away from each other, otherwise known as divergent plate boundaries, the spreading of the plates creates space for warm, partially molten material to rise up in between the spreading plates and solidify into new crust. This process primarily takes place at mid-ocean ridges, a vast undersea mountain chain of divergent plate boundaries and volcanoes that literally wraps around the earth like the seams on a softball. As new crust at the ridges forms, it pushes existing older crust off to the side, away from the ridge. This process is known as seafloor spreading. In addition, the mid-ocean ridges are substantially elevated relative to the rest of the ocean floor, and this formation of new crust, plus gravity pulling down on the mid-ocean ridges, creates a process of ridge push, helping drive plate motion. But that's not all. On the opposite side of a tectonic plate from a ridge, you'll often find a convergent boundary, where two plates are colliding. At convergent boundaries, the denser of the two plates involved will be shoved underneath the less dense plate and into the upper mantle in a process called subduction. Gravity and the density of the subducted plate, which is also called a slab at this point, pull the plate down into the mantle. Since the plate is rigid, this slab pull process also tugs on the rest of the plate, dragging it along with. So what really drives plate motion is a combination of ridge push, slab pull, and convection within the upper mantle. Cool, but how do we really know the plates are actually moving? Well, that's the topic in the next video, so we'll see you then.